Welcome back to the Best Practice Show. My name is Kirk Barron, and I'm your host, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over. And have you ever thought to yourself, gosh, I need a better way to look at restorative dentistry or take better care of my patients, and I just need a better way of thinking? Well, if you've ever asked that question, which is a big question, I've got an amazing guest today, Dr. Betsy Bakeman, who is a fabulous fabulous uh, dentist and also an amazing teacher. And we're going to change the way you think. Actually, she's going to change the way you think today with how to look at lowering risk and increasing prognosis. So do me a favor, stick around. You're going to absolutely love that. Now, if you're joining us for the first time, I always like to do a couple things. There's a lot of dental students and young dentists listening and you're like, what is this whole thing? Now, here's what I want to just say. We do all these videos. You guys never watch it, which I'm totally cool with. Um, over 140,000 audio downloads. So if you're listening to the podcast, just do me one favor. Go down, see if you're listening on Spotify on your phone or go down to that little button that says subscribe. Just press the subscribe button. And here's why. Because you're going to see every single week. I love this stuff. Like I love it so much that I have a disease. Like I really want to know more. Um, I want you to keep showing us, showing up with us every single week. Because you're going to see every single week, I'm going to bring you a brand new expert because I don't know that much. They do like you're going to see today. And I just don't want you to miss out. So just keep showing up with us as we keep providing. Because I want you to have a better practice and a better life. So make sure you do that. Now, I, I want to start by introducing my guest. Now, Betsy, in full transparency, you and I have really never met. You know, I was sharing with you before, but I've seen you speak like twice. And actually there was one time you wouldn't remember this, but I got invited to the American Academy of Restorative Dentistry. Now, no one knows this, but I wet my pants and the whole thing. Like I was so nervous to be there. I was in a full sweat. Jim Otten comes back and before I went live and Bill Robbins at SEC and they're all like, are you going to be okay? And I was hyperventilating. I'm like, those are all my heroes out there. And then I saw you and you were so nice. And you're like, oh, I am. And I was like, oh, okay, very nice. But um. <laughs> I know who you are, and uh, I'm so excited to have you on today. And I, but if somebody's listening and they've never heard who Betsy Bakeman is, I want them to know who you are. So can you just share share a little bit of your story and who you are? And I'd love for people to know that. Sure. sure. I, 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 well, we've got a major feedback there. Do you, you hear that? I'll, wait, hold on. Let me try this. No. We're good. Okay, so I'm Betsy Bakeman. I practice in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, I've, I've gotten involved in cosmetic dentistry and restorative dentistry and uh, the Koi Center. And I've just found that um, through the years, uh, I remember listening to people. I remember listening to people lecture and they would be like you. They would talk about what you do and they'd say, I love it. I just absolutely love it. And I think, I like dentistry, but I can't say I love it. And, you know, my kids were smaller, you know, young, and I wasn't doing as much CE. And the bottom line is the better you become at something, the more you like it. And, and so as I started to take CE and as I started to push myself and became accredited in the American Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry and got more involved in the profession, I love what I do. And uh, I'm one of those people that now can say, I love what I do. And my husband always says, you'll never retire. And he's probably right, but I, um, I, just, I just love it. So um, it's just been really fun. It's been fun being involved in the profession. That is so awesome. And I know, you know, dentistry is hard. It just is. It, and you got to find your way, in, you know, probably for you, just like me, education. It's, it's not so much the information. It's amazing it's the fire that gets lit when you start learning these things. And I want you to talk about the why. So today we're going to be talking about lowering risk and what you've learned from one of your most important mentors, Dr. John Coyce and why. But before we get into the thinking around, let's talk about the why and what it meant to you about risk assessment. 
Well, that the whole concept of lowering risk, of, of looking at a patient and making a complete diagnosis and sort of looking at where their risk factors for breakdown are um, and really categorizing that in a very simple way, low, medium, high, um, periodontally, biomechanically, which is the structural integrity of the teeth. So that's sort of the patient's risk for caries, erosion, um, and then functionally, load-based failure. Um, and then also looking at the patient for aesthetics. Do the teeth show? Um, because that has an influence on where we put the teeth and, and everything. So you sort of categorize in those four areas. Are they low risk, medium risk, high risk? Obviously, if it's high risk, that can lead to loss of the teeth or a tooth. And so you have to work to lower the risk. Now that may be treating the decay. It may be saying the decay is too out of control. We need to remove the teeth and move toward implants. Um, Load-based failures, you know, is this a parafunction patient? Is this just friction? Are the teeth rubbing together? And we can fix that the way the teeth come together. So we always are looking to lower risk. And the amazing thing that does when we really think about that and make a thorough diagnosis and we design our treatment plans to lower risk, we increase prognosis and predictability. And patients really get it. Like, for example, you can have someone that has four lower incisors. They've all been treated with full crowns. They have, they're endodontically treated. They have hosting cores in them. The patient just snapped one off at the gum line. They tell you another one broke off earlier and that it was re-cemented, but it wasn't re-cemented on correctly and now it feels a little awkward. You're already gonna have to put one implant in. And you're looking at this situation, I mean, it's not in great shape. So you have the opportunity to say to the patient, these teeth structurally are not in great shape. You've done everything you possibly can. We could put in one more implant and you could have a four unit bridge built on implants. There's something that is a much stronger foundation and you could be done with this problem. And patients just say, I absolutely wanna do that. Or you could just say, I have a problem, broken tooth, I'm gonna to put an implant here. And then the patient breaks off another tooth and then they break off another tooth and they're frustrated and angry um, and reasonably so. <laughs> and so it's just a different way of looking at things and looking at the whole patient and, and making some decisions about where to go with things. And people are so appreciative. You end up treating the patient for the long term and you create very happy, very pleased patients. And it doesn't mean you have to do it all at once. Sometimes we stage treatment over time, but, um, but you're going in that direction to lower risk and increase prognosis. And it's, it feels really good. Yeah. It feels like you're serving the patient. I love this. This makes so much sense on the restorative side as well as the patient side. And what you're really talking about is a system. Like this is a system. And can you talk about that? And why? So if you're a young dentist, listen, because systems are really important because you need a, a predictable way of thinking about cases instead of just dealing with them as they come in and go, which direction I go. go. And John Coyce is probably one of the best thinkers in all of dentistry. Like this is not something he just kind of whipped together. Like he is, he has the research. So it's a system of thinking and you can follow it predictably with patients and talk about how it changed the way you do dentistry just on the clinical side. Yeah. So, I mean, you have to force yourself to think of it. So John, you're right. He has systems that go through that, that go through perio biomechanics, the structural integrity of the teeth, the function and the aesthetics. And you actually have to write down in those areas and think about it in that way. And you, and you, in the beginning, you have to fill out the form. You have to start to get your brain to think that way. And you develop the risk assessment. And you say to yourself, okay, I know this patient wants veneers, but if I don't manage the function, the reason the teeth look this way, this whole thing's going to fail. Or if the patient doesn't treat the periodontal disease they have, they could lose, the, I could do beautiful veneers, but they're going to lose their teeth. Um, 
And so you, you sort of structure things that way. So the diagnosis goes in that order, perio biomechanics, function, and then aesthetics. But the treatment plan actually goes in the opposite order. We start with the aesthetics. We actually start with where the teeth go in the face and you actually work backwards from there. And you, there are six steps in the aesthetics, where the front teeth go, the upper front teeth, where the upper back teeth go, where the lower front teeth go, where the lower back teeth go um, in the face vertically. And then you start looking at where they are horizontally, which is step five. And then you start look at gingival architecture, step six, you fold in the function, you fold in the biomechanical considerations, like is the patient highly prone to decay? We're not just going to do a veneer on this tooth. Um, you know, we need to wrap this tooth and cover it, or maybe they have excessive erosion. Just covering one surface of the tooth is not going to help this patient because the erosion is going to take out the tooth. So you start to add all of those pieces in, in a very systematic way. And it works like a charm. I sort of, I, when I'm talking to students in, at the Koi Center, attendees there, I just say, you know, it's amazing because as you start to think about it, you can look at something that looks totally broken down, a patient whose bite is off and, and people become overwhelmed. I don't know where to start. And I just say, okay, let's just go through the steps. Just go through the steps. And it's like that. You feel like and when you get to the end, you found that last jigsaw puzzle piece. It's just like all comes together and it slides in and you're just like, oh, it's so exciting. It's going to be amazing. And from there, you have to think about, okay, how am I going to make it affordable for the patient? So you talk to patients about, okay, this is what we can do. Tell me you know, what your constraints are financially, time-wise, whatever that is. And I'll work to stage things. And, and now in dentistry, we have so many ways of staging treatment. You know, I mean, injectable composites and milled restorations and all, all various ways of staging treatment to help people, patients get the dentistry that they really want and need. Yeah. It's a perfect way. I mean, would you agree with this? Like you're keeping the quality, the constant, and this is where the time becomes the variable, you know, and the budget and maybe they're going away or whatever. You're not compromising what you're trying to co-create with the patient. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. Exactly. In the end you, you get there and um, it's just, how do you get there and how long is it going to take? Yeah. So I want you to talk about this too, because I think one of the things that dentists don't understand is no matter what you create, there's a, there's a lifespan to it. Everything in life is temporary. No matter if it's the most beautiful dentistry ever, we're dealing with a moving target, which is the patient. You know, we can't control what they do, their health. So the risk assessment piece is important because people are going to be living longer now. They say one in every three babies that's born today will actually live, live to be 100. Boy, I hope the materials, you know, really take off now that they'll be able to last more. But like when it comes to risk, you know, you're working with the patient to prolong this dentistry because you will have dentistry that fails. What we're trying to do is create a longer window that it works for longer periods of time and the patients understand how it's going to, how they make it work, right? Yes. I mean, you make two great points there. The patient that needs the most dentistry, um, they come, they're coming with the highest level of risk. And sometimes we can lower risk, but in some areas we're not able to, we just have to manage it and, and to the best of our ability, but we're, we're not able to, to eliminate it. And so that's where I find risk assessment is really important as well, because I actually talk to the patient about their presenting risk. But I also say, if we do treatment, I can help you with the way the teeth come together and bite and chew. Um, but you're also a nighttime bruxer. And, and so you need to wear a night guard. Or a patient's of high risk decay, we can treat the decay but unless the causative factors of the decay are eliminated, which probably aren't going to completely happen, um, you're still probably you're still at risk. These aren't virgin teeth, and um, and so so what the patient has to understand is oftentimes the greater risk they are, there are going to be issues going forward. We want to minimize them that we don't 
we're designing things so things aren't falling apart, they're losing multiple teeth, but could they chip porcelain? Um, could they need a root canal going forward? I mean, yes, you know, we are not completely, as you said, eliminating it, everything. And it's important to, for patients to own their level of risk. And, um, and so when I tell them, this is, this is where you are right now, but this is where we're gonna end up. We're lowering in these areas, we can't eliminate, or we're just managing, managing the risk. And this is how we're gonna manage it. And uh, so, yeah, so it's a great point. And, and um, because patients can be frustrated, sometimes the more money they spend, that would be a reason to think you're never gonna have a problem again, right? Right, right. Like I'm having all these weird flashbacks in my brain because I love this stuff. And so I, I can't remember. I think somebody said 20 years ago, like you can't fix periodontal disease. Like you can only manage it. So be careful. Don't ever say the word treat. And that was a turning point for me. But like I was like, oh my gosh, that makes so much sense. Because if you tell patients, you're just going to fix this. No, you've got a part to play and we're going to manage. So you're talking about managing all these conditions. Now I have so many questions to ask you. I mean, now you see all this stuff. It, when patients living longer, you know, with the pandemic and with the advancements in what we know, and even prescription medications that these patients come in, the lists are longer. I mean, xerostomia, I didn't even know what that was until a couple of years ago. So there's a lot more things that we have to be paying attention to in this. And I don't know, in your town, is periodontal disease disappearing? You know what I mean? Like, do you think risks are increasing over time with patients or, or not? Is it always going to be something we're going to have to educate ourselves more about? Well, disease is cyclical. So, um, you know, we, we, look, we would like to think that disease is linear, you know, but it's not. So the causative factors of disease have, if they're there or not. And then age certainly is part of the part of prognosis. So risk is a big part that, that determines prognosis, but, but so does the age of the patient. So you see an 18 year old with, that's drinking a lot of soda and has a lot of erosion or maybe has gastric reflux, which is an intrinsic source of acid, which is much worse um, uh, and harder on the teeth. So you see erosion on the teeth in an 18 year old, that's a much different prognosis than it is in an 80 year old. So, so those pieces play into, but things change, you know, someone that never had um, acid erosion, acid reflux their entire life. I mean, I had a patient just yesterday where all of a sudden I said, you know what, your fillings are standing proud on your teeth. And it almost looks like your teeth are, are melting away a little bit. Have you had any problems with gastric reflux? Are you, are you and he goes, maybe a little, but I said, I think you need to speak with your physician because if this is going on in your teeth, just think what it's doing to your esophagus. And, um, and so it wasn't a problem for him before, but it looks like it's a problem now. And uh, so, yes, and then certainly medications dry out the mouth. And we know that increases risk for caries. Um, there's all sorts of things that play, play in. And, and that's why people come in and have us take a look. Yeah. I love this. So let, uh, let's pretend I'm a 32 year old dentist. Listen, I'm like, Betsy, I totally get this. Like, I love it. Okay. How did you, because obviously I've got a team of people I care about. How did you bring that back? Because you're not the only one that understands this is you had to integrate it with your team. And then what I have specialists and I, I mean, I got to work with my specialists. Can you talk about how you integrated these concepts with your team and your specialists? So it's just, you know, at, at, at office meetings, talking about what, what I've learned and sharing what I know, um, it's really important. And it's also important to walk the talk. I mean, start to integrate the forms into the practice, start to treatment plan that way, start to talk to patients that way. And then the staff starts to understand all of that. I mean, I've, I encouraged my specialists to go out to the COI Center. Um, my oral surgeon I mean, he's amazing and he completely understands that. And he always says, I, I wish more people would treatment plan this way um, because we end up doing a lot of comprehensive care together. And, um, and he says, sometimes it just doesn't feel right to put an implant here and put another one in there. And, you know, as teeth break off and fail, 
without a big plan for the patient because the patient ends up spending a lot of money and it's not necessarily an ideal result. And, um, and so it's nice to have everybody on the same team. And for me, that was sort of a, a deal breaker. I mean, it's just so much easier to, to work with people that, that have the same language and, and are going in the same direction. We're all rowing in the same direction. Yeah. So on that very note, so let's say I'm loving this and I, I, I'm implementing in my practice. And let's say you have a patient that's a high risk, you know, either biomechanical or, or perio, and they want to go faster. How do you, how do you handle that? when they're probably not understanding the level of risk. Are you one of those people that go a little bit slower? Do you spend more time in the education? Because you hear this all the time. You're like, my, sometimes patients don't understand this. How would I deal with that if I'm a younger dentist and my patient's not understanding the level of risk they're at? Well, um, I'm a big one for, you know, not doing everything all in the first appointment. So I, for me, we have an hour and a half new patient exam. I see the patient, spend the time with the patient, get all the records. And then if there are bigger needs, there's more going on. Um, I talked to the patient about the fact that, that, you know, I would really like to get them back. The next step, if they're interested, would be to get some additional records and some models of their teeth. And I would sit down and figure out why this is happening to their teeth, because it's really important to figure out the why. Um, and, and it gives patients an opportunity to have, to go home and think about what I've said. Patients, in my opinion, do not decide what they're going to do while they're in the office. They decide when they're back home and they're with significant others. And and that's when they're making their big decisions. So they may say, you know what, I'm not worried about this tooth. It's been kind of the same you know, you tell me it's significant, but it's not bothering me. And I, and I say, when it, when it does, or if it does, you just let me know. And, um, and sometimes they'll be in hygiene. They'll say, this is getting worse, or my teeth are becoming sensitive. And what, what can we do? And I'd say, well, before we figure out what to do, we need to figure out why it's happening and make a diagnosis. And so the way we do that models and records, so then we get in models and records. And again, I'm sort of talking to them about their level of risk. And then during the consult, they, they've already sort of made a decision whether or not they're, they're interested in doing something about this or not. So the consult becomes very easy because we already have a relationship going and they've heard it several times. Now, Betsy, you're an incredible educator and you guys do a lot of training with all these young dentists that are just very excited. What are some of the pushbacks you get, if any, on risk assessment? Do you, I mean, do they ever go, but, 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 or misconceptions they have about going down the path of risk assessment? I just think they want to know more. Um, you know, they're at the Koi Center, there are nine courses um, and some of them are partnered um, together. So it's a full week of five days. Um, so, uh, the treatment planning and the, the occlusion, the first two are partnered together five, you know, days from seven in the morning until six at night. Well, they, they have the, all that information, but they're just hungry for more and they can't quite piece it all together because there's a biomechanics course. There's a perio restorative interface course. Um, there's advanced occlusion, and then there's two courses on implants, fixed and removable solutions. And so there's just, they want all the information. But the reality is you need to go back to your office, start to implement some of those things, because what will happen is people have questions. Like, I'm having trouble getting my patients to have models and records, or, you know, they'll bring their photography back. And we talk about the, the importance of the photography. It's huge. And um, so we say we need better photos and they realize that when we're going through it. So, um, so yeah, I would say the biggest thing is they can't, they want it faster, but there's something about taking it slowly and, and a few courses at a time and then going back to the practice and implementing. All right. Go back to that. Cause you know, I'm a big fan, but let's say, cause you get, I get, I have young kids and I'm like, you need to go. And they're like, I don't know. I mean, I have to leave my practice and it's an investment. I mean, what are they, you hear all this stuff all like, what are they going to teach me that I don't, I didn't already learn. Can you speak to that? Cause I feel like 
you have to slow down. In order to go farther in dentistry, you got to get away from your practice. You got to roll up your sleeves. You got to be around, you know, great thinkers. And, but, but you tell me what, what would you say to a young dentist who's like, I don't know, I can't afford it. And I'm like, you can't afford not to go. What would you say? It's the best, it's the best gift you can give yourself. I mean, think about, about how much time we're in practice and to love what you do and to lower your stress by having predictable systems and having patients say, yes, I'd like that. And having patients actually pay you fee for service for the work that you do. I mean, all around, it's just this amazing thing. And I, when I was younger, I was working two days a week. I was an, I was an associate in a practice for 20 years, actually a few different practices because my children were little, my husband's an orthopedic surgeon. And so I needed to be home a little bit more. And, and so I would allow myself one course course a year. Um, I sort of sped that up toward the end because you, you just want all the information, but, but it was just, every time I went there, I was just, I was so excited to go back and implement what I'd learned. And, uh, and it's, it just makes dentistry so fun. Um, and it reduces stress. It just really reduces stress on a number of different levels. Okay. So I'm in, where do I start? Which course do I go to? Cause you guys have a quite a few, like where, where do I start and what can I expect and why, why is the course experience different than others from your perspective? Like I would love to know. So the first two courses are, are treatment planning and occlusion. And those are together in one course, five days. You can have all, all five days. If you feel like, oh, I've been somewhere else and I know all about occlusion. And actually that was me. So <laughs> I was, I went out there for the peri-restorative interface and that's where, you know, where to place gingival levels, where your margins of your restoration should be in relationship to the bone all these things that I wanted to learn because I was going through accreditation and I needed to replace missing teeth and the aesthetic zone. And so that I knew there was information in that course that I needed to learn. So that was my first course out there. And you can take that as your first course. And we often have people say, you know, taking that course, but as soon as they take it, they realize there are some things about occlusion. I don't know. There are some things about treatment planning. I don't know. And I don't care where you are in practice. If you haven't been to the Koi Center and learned what John teaches, there are things to learn. And that's just what I was. I was like, I, I think there are some things about occlusion, things that he's saying that I am not understanding. And, um, and because so much of occlusion is taught in a static way. But John talks about how people chew. And he teaches you to look at how people chew. And we don't think about that. We're like rubbing models side to side. We ask patients, you know, bite together, slide right, slide left, go, go into protrusive. And then we think that's, that represents how the teeth fit together and bite and chew. Not at all. And, um, and so there are things to learn in occlusion. But if you feel like you know all that, then start with the perio restorative interface, course three. Um, and that's actually a near and dear to my heart because that's a course I help teach. We developed some model exercises for surgery um, and, and we do a lot of hands-on in that course. And, and it's my favorite. It was my first course out there and it's my absolute favorite. I love it, but I love them all. Uh, yeah. And it's bigger than the education. Wouldn't you agree? Like you get to meet some, it's the people component. That's awesome. You guys often use the word tribe, which I love. So talk about the people component that's beyond the education. Yeah, so the people are, I mean, the brain trust in that room, I mean, there are people that are highly skilled in implants, I mean, at all levels of dentistry, um, really talented group of people. And, and it, you know, John is such a caring, understanding um, person. And it has a tendency, the Koi Center attracts, you know, like people of like mind, and um, like spirit. And so, the people you meet there are very passionate about dentistry and really excel, um, really work hard to provide the best for their patients. And it's inspiring. And there are people that are amazing at photography and, and uh, all manners of, of dentistry, all different areas, but it's, it's incredible. I mean, now there are people that are really taking the digital realm and really exploding with that. 
um, that you that you know you have an opportunity to learn from. It's 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 really inspiring. Yeah. Well, I would agree with your husband's statement earlier that you'll never retire because you can see how excited you are about this. I think even if you didn't practice, you'd find a way to like get excited about dentistry and helping patients. And I, I'm at no, I, you know, I always like to ask people that are speakers, influencers, like you get to see a lot of stuff. You get to see a lot of research. It's anyone's guess, but what do you think we're going to see in the future of dentistry when it comes to risk assessment or increased prognosis? I mean, this is a very exciting time in dentistry, don't you think? Like, it's very, oh. what do you think the future looks like for some young dentists? Well, I mean, certainly I think we'll be able to put all the patient in, information into an algorithm and that the computer will spit that out. And, and basically, and that started, I mean, John's worked in developing a software program um, and that's certainly, that's all in place, but we'll have more data to show us that if the patient's here, more predictive value to the data. Um, you know, as, as we look like, I mean, I'm always thinking on a patient in my own practice, sometimes you'll see breakdown suddenly and I, I go back and I, and I look and say, could I have predicted this? Were there signs and symptoms that I could have predicted that this would happen? As we track more and more patients, you know, at, now we have digital scanners, we have radiographs, we can, you know, we can more precisely measure things. As that precision goes up, we'll be able to then look back and say, could we have predicted this? And if we can, let's do it from the get-go. And, and, and then we have science to be able to tell the patient, you know what, based on what you have right now, this is where you're going. And, and we take educated guesses. We combine what we know in science with our, our clinical knowledge um, that we've gained through the years. And that varies based on where we are in practice. And we, then we make recommendations to the patients, but it's not always science-based. Oh, awesome. Now for the benefit of people that might just be listening on Stitcher or Spotify, and they've never heard of this before, like, can you tell them where to go and it's Kois, K-O-I-S. I made that mistake years ago. I was looking for it and I'm like, I didn't know how to spell. So where would I go? How do I find out more? Where do I start? www.koiscenter.com. And there's lots of information on the website. Um, and if you want to speak with someone, you pick up the phone and call. I'm sorry, I don't have the number right here, but it's, it's on the website. And um, and at, like John Coyce, the his team of staff members are are really very incredible, really great people, very customer service oriented, and um, and learning out there is next to none. That's awesome. That's awesome. All right, you know what time it is. It's time for some fun. I I always like to uh, you know to humanize the superhero. I consider you one of the superheroes in dentistry. <laughs> so I don't even know what these questions are. So you agreed to just play along with me. So I'm going to ask you three questions. I'm just going to shake this up. This is so, this is like one of my favorite parts of the day. So, um, and I'll, I'll you go first. <laughs> I always like to volunteer you first. And then, the, so Betsy, here's the first question. What do you think, if you weren't a dentist, what do you think you'd be good at selling in another profession or anything? What, what do you think you'd be good at selling if you weren't a dentist? Anything come to mind? Um, I think I'd be good at selling um, architectural design. I, I always thought I would would be, in fact, I still consider it. I still consider going back and becoming an architect. Really? I just, I, I love, I love the way buildings function. When I designed my current office, I, I think I drove Mike on thanks team probably crazy because I would sit there at night and redraw things and move things around and they would try to convince me otherwise. And now I'm, I can see it. I, I'm living here. I know how this looks and I love the way things flow. And I love making, I just love that part of design. So I know I could sell, be great at doing that. Yeah. So you get the architectural digest and all that kind of stuff. Like you, like you totally geek out, like with beach, there's one called like beach homes. Like you just look at, you're like, Oh my gosh, are you a big fan? Who the, the couple in Waco, what are, what are their names? Uh, Chip and Joanna, like type, just design architecture, all that color patterns. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm, 
No, sort of the, the, when it gets down to, you know, the, the knickknacky kind of stuff and the, the, how it's going to be decorated. Not at all. It's not me. And um, my, I have sisters that are great at that part, but mine's more just, just woodwork and windows and the layout and the spaces. I, I love that. I love, I would love creating that. Well, in the event dentistry doesn't work out for you, we'll keep an eye out for you on some, I'll, I'll be like I, on some architectural show. I, she used to be a dentist. Look at that. That's so cool. I have no doubt you'd be crazy successful. Uh, <laughs> mine would be, I, you know, I told you I love food. I think I'd be like a great, I, you know, I was a three-time employee of the month at Applebee's when I was a kid, but like, I think I could sell food. Like I could, I could, friends of mine go, oh, where's the best restaurant? I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a restaurant and it's right. And you're going to want to go and it's awesome. Make sure you get the fagua. And then also like, I just, I love food, you know? So um, I don't know. It would, mine would probably be culinary of some kind, just cause I love, I'm a big fan of that guy Ferrari where he's driving all over the country, trying food. I, I'll watch that for hours. I'm like, that looks amazing. I don't know. That's funny. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Okay, hold on. What's the coolest nickname you've ever had or heard somebody else have? Is there a nickname that comes to mind? Um, I mean, my given name's Elizabeth, and and uh, you know, I go by Betsy. My mom called me Betsy from an early age. Um, but it's funny when I changed schools one time. I thought, you know, Elizabeth's a great name. I'm going to I'm going to go by Elizabeth. These people don't know me as Betsy. No one, no one would call me Elizabeth. I was Betty Bop. I was uh, Betsy Lou Who. I was Liz, Lizzie. I mean, every, every nickname from Elizabeth that you can possibly imagine. But, you know, in dentistry, we have lots of nicknames. You know, yeah. my husband always laughs about that. You know, Porky Will Height. And uh, we have Jimmy's and we, we have lots of, my husband always says, what is it with dentistry and all these people with all these nicknames? So, um, yeah, yeah, Jimmy Eubanks, like it, it's all, fun. you know, it's almost like one of your kids, you know, how you never talk, call your kids their real names. You know, I have a Zoe, I call her Zoe, 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 Zeroni or like something like that. We're always adding. That's so funny. You say that, that I, and I was curious about the Betsy Elizabeth thing. So now, now we know. Yeah. I, was, I finally just said, call me Betsy because I never knew who they were talking to. They just they would always come up with a nickname for me. So, well, I got to tell you, because it's the first time we've officially, I was a little nervous whether to call you Elizabeth or Betsy. And I just called you that. And I was hoping you respond really well, you know, and you're, you're pretty easy going, you know, some people go, no, please call me Elizabeth. And you're, you're not like that. You're pretty cool. So, oh gosh. Um, Nickname. Uh, so you'll love this. So I walked on, played, fo played football at the University of Minnesota. We'll use the word play loosely because I never really played. But like the, the equipment, um, the, the equipment guy who's in charge, his name was Dick Manson. Freshman year, he could never get my name right. So my name's Kirk Beard. He called me Bernie Bernstrom. I'm like, that's not my name. Well, everybody else thought that was the funniest thing. So for my entire life, they you all, I, I still see them. Bernie, I'm like, that's. It's not my name. He messed it up and you guys ran with it. So that's like the running joke. Like Bernie, where'd you get the Bernie Bernstein? I'm like, it wasn't like fun, but that's how it all worked. So, okay. Here's question number three. Last one. Are you a collector of anything? Any like a collection? Are you a collection person? Do you have anything that's a collection of any kind? I have antique salt and pepper shakers. What? Wait, 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 wait. You don't lift them from restaurants, do you? You actually purchase them like some, some people? Yeah, I know. Purchase. Actually, a lot of them were um, my stepfather's mother had collected them. And they're just, they're just lovely. So I have this little curio cabinet in our back entryway. And I change them out based on the season. And, um, and they're just, I mean, many of them are 50 and 60 years old. Um, and then my children will occasionally buy me, uh, you know, a salt and pepper shaker and, and, uh, but yeah, I mean, when my daughter became engaged, there's a little one that's sort of a, it looks like a wedding license and then a little ring. Um, and I set those out and for Christmas and Thanksgiving and all the turkeys and in the fall, you know, the corn and the different vegetables, it's just fun. It's just, they're, they're, and they're beautiful. They're yeah. just beautiful. Which one's your favorite set? Do you have a favorite set, like a, your go-to one? 
Well, probably my grandmother had these large turkeys that she always put out on the table um, for Thanksgiving and two sets of them. And I, and I just love those because it reminds me of Thanksgiving dinners when I was a child. So those are probably, I would have to say those are my favorite. I love this now. So see what's so cool is that now when I see you, I'm going to razz you about in a good way, like salt and pepper. If we ever have dinner together, I'm going to go, Betsy, what do you think of these two? Like <laughs> thumbs up, thumbs down. What do you think? It's so fun to get to know this stuff about people. So very cool. Very cool. I am not a collector or any, I'm actually a purger. So when my wife goes away, she'll go like, we had a whole bunch of stuff. Where did it all go? I'm like, I don't know. Like <laughs> it's all gone. I'm like, but I do collect hats cause I've never had hair. So I, I love like hats. If I ever see a hat, I'll buy like three of them. And my wife is like, you have 90 of them. I'm like, I don't know. I just I like hats. I don't even know why, but uh, it's good stuff. Well, Betsy, I am so grateful to have you on and I'd love to have you back again and again and again, just talk about things that are important, but uh, thank you so much for being on. I really appreciate this. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And lastly, if somebody wants to reach out to you, you're listening, you know, I know you're a very gracious person. How do I find, where, where, where like, how do I find you? Like, e- you email, yeah, email's the easiest. So DRB, Dr. B uh, at BakemanDDS.com. And, uh, and I'm, and if I don't answer right away, because I, some days, you know, it's just, gets crazy. Um, you know, just email me again. I'm always grateful when someone, if I, if I wasn't able to get to something and someone says, Hey, I, did you receive my email? And, oh yeah. Okay. I did I just haven't answered yet. So happy. Same. I'd be embarrassed to show you how many emails are in my inbox, right? I'm just not the best at it. So I'm along the same route. So this is so awesome. I can't thank you enough for being on. So stick around while we say goodbye to everybody else, but thank you guys for listening or watching or wherever you consume podcasts, listen to the best practices show. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did, just do us a favor, hit the share button, keep sending us suggestions for things that you want to see from Betsy. Cause we'll have her back again and again, and we'll ask her the questions, you know? So, uh, and until we see you guys next time, Keep watching the best practices show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day.